Hello and welcome. I'm the Radio Mechanic and this is another episode of the 10 Buck Test Bench where we try to bring bargain test equipment and old radios back to life on a budget. And today on the bench we have my old model IM13 VTVM when I was making the last video when we were uh, repairing, restoring the Heathkit signal tracer, it dawned on me that I had this VTVM tucked away somewhere in my, let's call it, pile of golden goodies. It hadn't had any attention for many years, and what happened was this used to sit on my microwave oven repair bench. I had a bench dedicated just to fixing microwave ovens back when it was lucrative back in the days when it was a transformer, a rectifier, a capacitor, a magnetron, a mechanical timer, and some interlocks. You could turn most microwaves around in an hour. But when they started putting high-end electronics in the front end of them and it was costing half the crop price of a microwave oven or a new microwave oven to replace the board, it just wasn't, uh, it wasn't a good business anymore. People aren't going to spend half the cost of a new microwave oven for a control board, and most of them are covered in uh, conformal coating, and some of them have proprietary chips. It just wasn't worth the work anymore. At any rate, this was on the bench along with the high voltage probe for checking the power supplies in the microwave ovens. And one day, the meter died something happened. It started banging, you know, opposite ends and then it would go half scale and then it would bang to zero and then it would go up and then it would work right for five minutes. So something failed and at the time I was too busy. I had too many jobs going and I just shoved this thing aside and I grabbed another meter and uh, this has sat unloved and unattended probably 15-20 years now. It's just been sitting in a pile of stuff in the corner hidden away and I dug it out and I figured I'd go through and see if I can repair this. Now this is actually a nice little meter. You can see it's facing up at you, tipped up so it's easy to read. The base is removable. If you want it to be very short height it sits on little foam feet on the bottom and what's the beauty of this base is it can swing around to the back. It's got mounting holes in it so you can mount it to the wall if you wanted to get it up high. Or if you have a test bench that has a fairly high shelf, you can swing the bracket all the way around to the top and mount the meter up under the shelf and get it off the bench. It leaves you more bench space underneath. I wish a lot more equipment had this type of a mounting bracket. But at any rate, we're going to, well, let's turn it on. Let's see what happens. This, let's just take a look at what it's doing. See if it's still misbehaving. And uh, I'm not too worried about the capacitors in it because this thing was all recapped at one point in time. And they're not all that old. So let's see what it does. Well, it seems to be pegged all the way to the left hand side of the scale. Let's go to ohms. Now it's pegged all the way to the right hand. Okay, let's set zero. It almost appears to be functional. Wow, that's an awful slow response. Nope, nope, see I was going that direction, now it's going back up. And it's doing it again. And now it's off on the zero end. Some may say, well, it hasn't warmed up yet, but. No, well, it almost appears to be behaving now. Anyway, I'm going to go through this thing. We'll open it up and see if it settles down. Bang! It's hitting the ohms head and real hard now. And in fact, it won't even come back 
to infinity. It's pegged. It won't come back. Bang. It doesn't even have enough range left in the knob. Okay, so something is definitely wrong with it still. DC, let's see if that'll zero. That zeroed. It was misbehaving on all the ranges at the time. Yep, it's creeping up, creeping up. Let's open it up and see what we've got. Give me a couple minutes. Okay, we've got the cover off this puppy. And everything in here has been recapped with a couple of exceptions. This one here is a 1600 volt capacitor which I didn't have at the time and I actually have one on order just in case that's the one the AC is fed in through. But that wouldn't be the problem because it's not in the bridge circuit. Even if that capacitor was a dead short it wouldn't cause the symptoms I was having. The only other capacitors that haven't been changed in here are a couple of disc ceramic caps. Uh, they're a couple hundred volt rated and they're only seeing a handful of volts in their configuration there across the grids of the uh, 12AU7 bridge tube and while it's not beyond uh, you know conceivably could they be bad yeah but I seriously doubt that disc ceramics are breaking down at grid voltages um, we'll take a look at the schematic here in just a second my suspicion is the tube 12AU7 and I have a whole box of 12AU7s in fact this is a brand new one I just stuck in there because I'm I'm pretty confident I'm gonna find there's a problem with this tube let me show you the schematic and show you my reasoning and by the way I got admonished on my last video for not shotgunning all paper capacitors and uh, the purpose of that video was to teach people why these capacitors need to be changed what leakage uh, or what the leakage of certain capacitors will do in the radio the f your capacitors when you open up an old radio anything across the AC line whether it's paper or disc ceramic chop that thing out of there and put what's called a safety cap a poly cap in there that's designed to fail safely and uh, the one in the grid circuit for the uh, power tube for your beam power tube always has to be checked for leakage before you power up so you don't destroy the tube but the reason for not shotgunning everything is you want to go through and we'll cover this in more detail as we go on with uh, more radio repairs you go through the schematic you find tubes that could are tubes capacitors that could conceivably cause a problem with leakage check those quickly and then you want to try to get the set to operate before you shotgun all the capacitors in there because if it doesn't work after you shotgun the caps you know just change everything like a shotgun blast if the thing doesn't work you're gonna say did it work before or is it something I did now instead of just tracking down a single fault you're going to have to go through and backtrack on every capacitor and every solder connection you've made in the radio okay uh, here we are this is the bridge circuit that controls the meter the meters right here and the meter is connected through this switch and through some resistors to the two cathodes here and the way it works is the bridge zero balances here it balances the current on these two cathodes that causes the meter to drop down to zero this grid always is conducting at the same level because it's a fixed bias and when you turn your range range switch you introduce a small voltage on this grid which unbalances the bridge circuit and causes the motor to, uh, the motor the meter to swing back and forth it's a pretty simple circuit it looks complex here because of the switch and all the calibration pots but in reality it's really a pretty basic circuit I suspect nothing on this side of the schematic is the problem the reason being 
the only thing they have in common is this. Uh, you have AC, DC, and ohms uh, are over, or excuse me, let me back up here. This 6AL5 is used for nothing but AC. This is just a rectifier. This rectifies the incoming AC to DC, and then the switch sends that DC down this line just like it would uh, if you were measuring DC, it just, you know, we, when you switch it to DC, it brings the DC directly from the probe into the grid through a series of resistors down here, which set your range. When it's on AC, it goes through this rectifier. When it's on ohms, the only thing it's using are the decade resistors for ohms and the battery. Oh, and before anybody freaks out, the battery in there was new. Before I started the video, I did change the battery. So let's not uh, let's not freak out and say I should have, uh, you know, the batteries could have leaked in there. I took the battery out before the meter was put into storage. Uh, let's see. I suspect it's this tube. Now I'm going to test the tube and see if there is indeed any grid, uh, cathode to grid leakage. It's fairly common with 12AU7, 12AX7s to develop a small, not cathode to grid. <whistles> Erase that, back it up. I'm getting ahead of myself here. Heater to cathode. Heater to cathode leaks are fairly common in here and that will alter the current on the cathodes and it could cause the problem we're seeing. So I'm going to test this tube and see if there's any heater to cathode leakage. Now it would only take a tiny, tiny, tiny imbalance in these cathodes to cause the meter to swing back and forth. Remember, this is a VTVM with an input, input impedance of around 10 mega ohms. So it takes very, very little voltage change or current change through the tube to upset the balance of this meter. So, I'm going to go over to the tube tester. Okay, we have in front of us an Ico 666 tube tester. This belonged to my father many years ago. He bought this brand new. It's been set up for 12AU7, and I'm going to plug it in and let it warm up. And we have a range of buttons here we press for checking shorts and merit, in other words, uh, how much gain the tube has, as well as heater to cathode leakage. So we start with number two, pin number two, which I believe is a grid. Yes, pin number two is a grid. And no shorts to the grid. I didn't expect to see anything. Now three, the meter is going to go full scale and then I press the heater to cathode leak button and it should drop to zero and it's not. It's not a lot but it is not sitting on the zero and it should sit at zero. So we will go to the next half of the tube. The next grid is pin seven, no shorts. Pin eight is the next cathode that should cancel in entirety and it's not. So there's definitely some heater to cathode leakage in that tube. Now, I'm going to zero that out. Actually, let's take a look at the merit of that tube. I never did check that. It's questionable. And the other half of the tube would be six. And that's right on the edge. So it's probably time to change that tube anyway. Let me get the tube that I and replacing it with. Here's the one that came out of my stash of uh, vacuum tubes. I had a bin full of these. And I'm just going to throw it on three so we can see when the tube starts to conduct. Alright, that should cancel. Goes right to zero. Just like it should. The next leakage would be on eight right to zero. So no heater to cathode leakage at all in that tube. Pin one is the first half of the tube right up in the good range. Pin six right up in the good range. So that's a good 12AU7. We'll put this thing in and see how it ends and, up. And uh, by the way, the 12AU7 
can be replaced with a 5814. The 5814 is basically a mil spec or instrument rated version of the 12AU7. It's designed for high reliability in military and high-end commercial equipment and it's designed specifically to address that heater to cathode issue that so many of the 12AU7, 12AX7s experienced. Um, there's another version I believe, yeah there's a, a mil spec version of the 12AX7 as well but the 5814 is very fairly common if you see a you know a bin of those at one of the flea markets grab them they're nice to have in your stuff. Okay the tube is installed the meter is warming up and then I'll have to do a calibration completely recalibrate this because the gain of the tube is so much higher than the one that came out of there and uh, however I am not going to do anything to this until uh, this thing has completely warmed up for a couple of hours. I'm going to just let this thing warm up for two or three hours, let the tube burn in and settle down, and then I'll come back and we'll do a calibration for you. It'll just be a couple of seconds. It'll be the next scene. But for me, I'm going to have to let this thing sit for a couple of hours and settle down and we'll do a calibration on it and see where we stand. If uh, if all the problems okay. are solved. This has been running for a few hours. It seems to have settled down nicely and uh, we'll get on with the calibration. Before we do though I got a message from a fellow tube-dude who mentioned something to me that I should have mentioned. It's in the manual. Is you shouldn't really use one of those noise meters on a solid-state radio because the hundred and special, or excuse me, you shouldn't use the noise function on one of those signal tracers on a solid state radio because of the 138 volts. You can break down sensitive transistors. Uh, if you're going to use it on components in a transistor radio, pull the component out of the radio to test it. And uh, he also mentioned that he put a full wave rectifier in his, probably a little bridge, I'm going to guess. And uh, he said it quieted down the AC hum to just about negligible. Uh, I'm happy with the way this one is, to be honest. Uh, for what it's used for, it's fine. But uh, if the noise, a little bit of hum, background hum bothers you, I would try that. Put the uh, full wave recti rectifier in there. And he also added a resistor to make sure the voltage stayed the same. Because when you go from a half wave to a full wave rectifier, the voltage is going to go up probably 10 volts at least. Um, and something else that needs mentioning, you know, because this is older gear, a lot of people see these capacitance meters and they've got leakage settings that are marked 20 volts. You see the little sign up here that I put on this to remind anybody touching this thing. That's a lie. The 20 volt leakage setting is actually around 110 volts. It takes anywhere from 60 to 80 maybe even 90 volts to trigger one of these neon lamps to blink so on the 20 volt so-called range setting it's actually closer to 100 volts so don't go using that on your low voltage uh, you know 6, 8, 12 volt capacitors to test for leakage because they'll uh, they will break down uh, and I proved that once and I believe I did a video I took a, like a 6 volt capacitor and set it on the 20 volt scale and uh, let it sit for a few minutes. It was a big electrolytic capacitor. And when it charged up, you heard snap internally. It broke down. Okay, this is settled down. Oh, and one I got another thing I want to bring up. I had uh, a viewer some time back after I did one of my videos and I was doing this on the meter and he admonished me by saying there's something wrong with your meters if you're tapping the face. Well, back in electronics school in the military they teach everybody with analog meters to tap them on the face. I know most of the electronics schools back in the day would say with an analog meter tap it on the face to make sure it settles and a lot of manuals including this heat kit one state right here to zero the meter and just a little screw and gently 
tap on the face to make sure it goes zero. So let's put that one to bed as well. Uh, oh, and while we're dispelling things, there's another one that bugs me. Might as well get it all off my chest at once. The last number in a tube designator, like 12AU7, 12AX7, is not the number of active elements. I hear that rumor perpetuated over and over and over again. In fact, I'm going to grab a tube manual here. And let's look up 12AU7, 12AX7. 12AU7. We have one, two, three, four, five, six active elements. The heater is not an active element. And I know somebody's going to say, oh, yes, it is. Oh, no, it isn't. Let's take a look at 5U4, 5Y3, shall we? Let's, uh, well, let's down here, let's see. Oh, here's a couple more examples. 6B4. Now, in this case, the filament, quote unquote, is an active element because there is no cathode. The filament is the cathode. 6B4, one, two, three elements. 6B5, 6B5 is an indirectly heated cathode, so the filament does not count. 6B5, one, two, three, four, five, six active elements. There are thousands of examples in this book that uh, follow along here. Let's see, 5U4, 5Y3, uh, 5B4, 5, 5U4. One, two, three active elements. And before somebody tells me, yeah, but the filament's in two pieces, it's two elements. No, it's a single element. It's the way it's drawn, it's used, it's considered a single element. 5U4, one, two, three. Now we go to 5Y3, and it will be. Uh, XY, 5Y3 does seem to follow that convention. And if you're going to make the argument that it's two separate filaments, why is this a 5Y3 and not a 5Y4? So, because mechanically, this 5Y3 and the 5U4, internally, mechanically, they are almost identical. It's just the size of the anode and how much current they'll carry is the difference between a 5U4 and a 5Y3. So, don't get into the trap. Okay, 6BY5, six, six active elements, not five, six active elements. Or no, excuse me, I'm lying to you, four active elements, indirectly heated cathodes, one, two, three, four. Okay, now in some cases, the number of active elements does equal that number, and maybe back in 1930, they thought they were going to do it that way, but that convention would have fallen apart very quickly. Not complaining, I'm just trying to keep you from getting caught out. All right, zero adjust. Set the function switch to DC plus. The nice thing about this meter is you can access the calibration points from outside. That could be good and bad. That means everybody with a diddle stick is going to play with it whether they know what they're doing or not. But for the technician where it's on his bench, it's kind of a handy feature to have. All right, set the switch to DC. Check operation of the zero adjust control. Okay. And if we go minus DC, it, it may have twitched. Yeah, now I've knocked it out. Okay, dead steady. It says it should st it should stay when you switch between plus and minus DC. If everything's good, it'll stay there, and it does. Dun dun dun. Should be possible if there's an appreciable zero shift of more than two divisions on the scale. It should be regarded as merely an indication that additional aging of the 12AU7 is required. And it says leaving the instrument turned on for a period of 48 hours or more is probably a good practice. DC calibrate, insert the test lead into the phone plug, it's in there, set the function switch to plus DC, it's plus DC, set the range switch to 1.5, it's 1.5, and the probe to DC. Now on your 
VTVM probes, you're going to have a DC position and an AC ohms position. So we'll set it to the DC position. Connect to a flashlight battery and adjust the DC calibrate so the meter pointer falls directly over the small red dot. Now that was for carbon zinc batteries back in the day. Uh, what I'm going to do is use this as my reference or this is my standard because I know this meter is very accurately calibrated. So we're going to set this one to DC volts. We will set this one to 1.5 and I should have a fresh battery over here. Make sure I set this one to DC. It is set to DC. You can see all the needles dance as I touch things. Okay, this is reading off scale. <laughs> ah, because these are more than 1.5 volts. Let's see. Do I have a semi dead battery? I don't have one of my good power supplies up here. And in fact, I sold off some of my DC supplies this weekend. I do have a triple supply on the bench downstairs. Let me let me get a voltage reference. Okay, hang tight. I knew as I watched two of my variable DC supplies walk away with the guy who bought them this last weekend that uh, I was going to regret it. And right the moment I do, but once I get all of this stuff moved down to my main test bench, I have another couple more variable supplies down there, and I'll be fine. I'll get by. We've got one of these Chinesium voltage standards, which aren't bad. According to my HP, uh, they're pretty much on the money, and that's the HP that Charlie now owns. Uh, 2.498 is what I've got it set for, basically 2.5 volts. And let's see, that meter over there shows it as almost exactly 2.498. So we'll use that on this one. The only reason they tell us to use the one and a half volt range is because they could use a flashlight battery and go to that reference point. Uh, let's see here. Looking for the right lead. There, that one goes there. This is my plus. Where's my minus? Here it is. So we want 2.4. Well, that's almost there. That's close enough. I'm surprised. It's virtually on the money. 2.498. All right. Well, maybe that's not quite zero. Let's check. Okay, it's moved a little bit. No, it hasn't. Just didn't return to zero all the way. Not uncommon. Okay, it's a little high. A little bit high. DC Cal. Just like the book says, we're going to tap. Two point four nine eight. It's about a needle's width that way. I don't know how it looks in the camera, but just about on the money. Two and a half volts. Alrighty, we'll uh, pull the battery out of this. You can run this on a twelve volt supply, and the switch will turn it off and on. But Chinesium, they didn't set the battery up so that it can be turned off and on. Go figure. And before anyone out there calls me a racist, I've been working, traveling in Asia for 42 years, give or take. My girlfriend's Thai. I have a buddy in Malaysia who calls me on a regular basis. I got friends all over the world. When I say Chinese or make fun of China, I'm talking about what has happened to them because of the Communist Party. I am not talking about the people. When I say China, I mean the Chinese Communist Party and its total lack of scruples or morals. 
So you can call me racist all you want. I'm going to laugh in your face. My girlfriend will laugh in your face. My buddy in Malaysia will laugh in your face. I am talking about the Communist Party and what they have done to the poor people in China. They have just ruined their lives. And if you don't like me talking about it, go watch another channel. Smarten up, America. I spent many years over there. I know what they're all about. Okay. Um, next, DCA Ohm's check. Where's the AC calibration? Aging and final... Oh, AC calibrate. Here we go. Temporarily move the phone plug. Phone plug's out. From the switch, set the range switch to 1.5 volts and the function switch to AC. Adjust the AC balance control so no motion is detected when switching AC through DC and, and so on. So in other words, wherever it is on the AC and DC or on the DC settings, the AC settings should be the same. That zeroes the AC so that the needle sits in the same position as it does on the DC setting. Okay, AC balance is done. Adjust the AC calibration control until the meter pointer indicates 117 volts AC when it's connected to the line. Now, what I am going to do is, uh, I guess I can get a line cord and plug it into my isolation transformer up there and we'll measure it on that meter which was calibrated against the Hewlett Packard's uh, laboratory grade meter and then we'll make this one match it. Okay, Let me find it. I have paralleled up the two volt ohm meters. They're both set on 150 volts. You remember the alligator clip that was stuck on the front of the uh, VTVM so that it wouldn't get lost? That's for this probe. I use it on here. I just press it on. It's a press fit and I've got an alligator clip that way. Both probes are set on AC and I'm going to turn on my heath kit. And if you want to see what that thing is, this is an isolation and variac. It's an isolation transformer and a variac. And I mention this all the time, a variac by itself is not an isolation transformer. It is reference to the line, but this has both inside. And, oh, <laughs> I gotta set this meter on AC. Okay, that meter set on AC. And let's scale here. One, let's go for, yeah. Okay, there's 120 volts AC. I gotta remember not to touch the probes. And you can see the AC calibration's off. So we'll bring this up. So they're both reading 120 volts AC, 120 volts AC, 120 volts AC. That meter's good to go. I'm gonna shut off the AC before I forget and light up my life. Disconnect that, pull the plug out of the front of it so that there's no accidents. Now I skipped over the ohms function because I wanted to get on with the rest of the calibration. Okay, zero adjust is still almost perfect. Oh, I gotta be on, yeah, I am on AC ohms, and the ohms adjust. 
and the check for that is to check both ends of the range and make sure it'll it'll zero and go up to infinity everything else is set by the resistors inside the meter so as long as the resistors are in count you know aren't, haven't been burned up or are in tolerance the meter's good so that's it we have another VTVM and again you're going to get some interaction between ohms and, and uh, ACDC it's going to change a little bit but uh, perfectly normal oh I went to off dummy 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 one click too far okay that's nice and steady and ohms is probably going to be off just a little bit yeah but actually no it isn't it's on no I guess it is R times one yeah the zero is going to be off a little bit but that's typical of these meters every time you change range you have to tweak a little bit and bring it in as far as I'm concerned that's fixed that is a repaired Heathkit IM13 VTVM so if your meter begins to act erratically like that swinging back and forth it's just possible that you have a heater to cathode leak and uh, one of the quickest things to do is just swap it out for a known good tube and see if that problem goes away and on this one it did and uh, it's funny I woke up about 2 a.m. last night thinking about this and I said I bet the tubes got a heater to cathode leak and it did I'm the radio mechanic hope somebody found this halfway interesting or hopefully useful and uh, shortly we should have a radio in our hands and we will go through the signal tracer how to troubleshoot with that puppy warnings cautions and uh, so on and so forth we'll have some fun I hope till later see ya but wait there's more why didn't you guys tell me I was looking at the wrong scale I was looking at the peak to peak scale the RMS scale here is 120 volts so this is still low this has got to come up some more I'm glad you guys caught me now it's calibrated on AC I know sooner turn the camera off and look back at the uh, other meter over here and I realized I was being stupid that's peak to peak DC RMS is this scale and DC RMS is these black scales the peak to peak one so we're on 1.2 on, on 150 volt so that's 120 volts 120 volts on the money now I can put it to bed Bye. But wait there's more I promise this is it this is something I meant to do and I spaced it I get asked all the time why on top of my meters I have this R times 1 300 milliamp years R times 1 150 times 10 15 and so on you should characterize your meters the reason being it's not uncommon today to see fuses that are a tenth or a tenth of an amp 150 milliamp years if you were to put this on R times 1 setting and test those fuses you'll have a whole box of bad fuses they'll all test bad because you'll blow every one of them because on R times 1 this passes 300 milliamp years through the probes it'd be 30 milliamp years on R times 100 and 3 milliamp years on R times 1000 or excuse me, R times 10 would be 30 milliamp years. R times 100 would be 3 milliamp years. This meter, 150 milliamp years on R times 1. Even though this is a, a 10 meg ohm VTVM on the ohm scale, it passes a lot of current. 150 milliamp years, that's still enough to blow a 100 milliamp year fuse. So you'd want to go to the R times 10 or the R times 100 scale to test those fuses to be safe. So we're going to do the same thing to this meter, and, and Charlie, that meter I sold you, uh, the Hewlett Packard, I think that's one milliamp here on R times one, if I remember correctly. That's a sweet little meter, but 
be that as it may. Okay, we're gonna go over here. I'm gonna go on the DC milliampere scale. I'm gonna go to 100 milliampere's to start. Actually, and we will put this on ohms. Okay, we're on the R times one scale on ohms. So we're gonna be passing the maximum current. So this would be zero adjust. Full scale, that doesn't matter. We don't even have to do that. Now, I'm going to go negative, negative, positive, positive. And we're over 100 milliampere, so it's probably the same thing. It's probably 150 milliampere. That's almost 175. No, it's 150. I'm sorry. Where am I? One. Yeah, 150 milliampere. If I'm looking at the right scale, 110 times 10, 10. Yeah, 150 milliampere, just like the other meter. So I'm going to write that down. R times 1 is 150. And then we'll go to R times 10. And it should drop down to about 15 milliampere. So we're on a 100 milliamp scale, 15 milliampere's. Should be, you know, in, in stages of 10 all the way down. You should have, you know, or decade steps all the way down. And we're on the 10 milliampere scale, so that's one and a half milliampere's, 1.5, just like the other VTVM. They're in decade steps. So I'm gonna make a label and put it right on here. And from now on, at a glance, I'll know R times one is 150 milliampere's, R times 10 is 15, R times 100 is 1.5. And I'll know on this one, R times one is, sorry about the quick move, is 300. And it means R times 10 will be 30, R times 100 will be three. And, I, and yes, I know, I am aware that the resistance of the other meter does drop the current somewhat, yada, yada, yada. It's not exactly precise, but it's close enough to give you a good heads up that you can blow up a fuse or any sensitive circuit that won't handle 150 milliampere's on R times one or when you're doing resistance checks. That's the end, I promise. See you next time, bye.